here we're looking at a D flip-flop. If D started changing in the middle of this high pulse right here, when the clock says open your eyes up and look at the input, if D dropped, then we would expect to see Q drop. Now when your eyes are open for a period of time, and this D is changing, when you shut your eyes becomes the most important event. That's when remembering starts. So this D up here has to remain high a little bit longer after the clock goes low. So whatever D's value was during this period of time, right up here, is what's remembered down here all through this period of time. So then the question is, why did you have your eyes open right here? If this is what's remembered, then all the changing that you saw during this period of time is meaningless. If this is not a clock and it is an enable line, then what out there in the world says, open your eyes, now shut your eyes? Well, this could be some kind of sensor also, you know, like an infrared sensor or a CO2 sensor. And this D could be a sensor. They're both then this turns into a type of input that's sort of like the master of all. These flip-flops were evolving around 1954. This is way before computers and computers were collecting data. So this term master, the master input on the enable line, was an unfortunate choice of words because then there were slaves and there were a hierarchy of these devices. Today, what we see is this world of asynchronous flip-flops built into our sensors. So we can have a digital Hall effect sensor that senses magnetic fields and we can have an analog Hall effect sensor. And today, if you had to choose, you would want an analog Hall effect sensor because it would give you more data. You want to take data on a rhythmic basis from an experiment and you want to use software to, and human eyeballs to determine what is valid data. In order to collect more data, this turned from an enable line into a clock and these pulses became regular, not irregular. Here we have two down, one up, right, one down, here we have three up, right, they turn into a regular clock pulse. The sad thing is, is that we stopped pursuing how the brain works. We lost track of the fact that ultimately the events that trigger memory are in the data itself, not in the clock. So this is why chapter nine is so interesting and why chapter nine is no longer how to design a CPU. So here we see the clock with a regular pulse, half on, half off, half on, half off. We see the data being set up before the clock pulse and the data uh, steady during the hold time. The hold time is be from here to here. This is when actually the output starts becoming affected. Here we see the data being set up. Good. Now this is data being set up. That's good. But after the rising edge detects that data, we see the data bouncing around. All this will be lost. We need a faster clock pulse to pick up this data. These issues come up in um, a variety of classes that are in the future for you. How do we account for it? How do we talk about it? This is called rising edge trigger. This rising edge triggers us looking at the data. So here we see a D flip-flop, here's the data coming in, and we see the clock coming in. And yeah, it's getting complicated because we want to try to trigger on the rising edge. This is what its circuit symbol looks like. This triangle right here means its edge triggered on the rising edge. This up arrow right here means that it's triggering on the rising edge. It's looking at the data on the rising edge. If the clock's a zero, it doesn't matter what the input is, it's just going to remember. If the clock's a one, it doesn't matter what the input is, it's just going to remember. 
This is why we want the clock going as fast as possible. So here we're triggering on the falling hinge. We don't see the circuit. It doesn't really matter anymore. Our goal is to understand what these symbols mean and what the possibilities are out there in the marketplace for buying these things or what the options are in the symbols we use when designing using Logisim or Xilinx software when we're creating our VHDL, what, what kind of libraries of code, what it means inside the library to see a D flip-flop that's falling edge triggered. Well, it means on that falling edge, it looks at, at D, and if it sees a zero, it remembers a zero. If it sees a one, it remembers a one. Once it gets down there to zero, doesn't matter what D is. Once it gets up there to a one, doesn't matter what D is. Here we have a D flip-flop that has built into it a active low preset and an active low clear. This is like a second flip-flop and it behaves a lot like a SR flip-flop. But what active low means is that we look at the zero and we say the zero is true. So under this pre column, zero is when something happens. So this is the preset and it sets the, the output at a one. And here we have the clear, active low clear, so when it's a zero, it's clearing our output. Doesn't matter what the input is. When they're both zero, then they're both true, then this is the evil situation in the SR flip-flop. We don't want it ever to happen. Now, the rest of this is our, a normal D flip-flop. A rising edge, a normal rising edge D flip-flop. and when both of these are false, when neither of these are active, remember they're active low, they're active when they're zero, they're true when they're zero. So when they're both ones, they're not doing anything. They're not influencing the circuit at all. They're only influencing the circuit when they're zeros. And the nasty situation is when they're both zeros. Now the key difference here is the D flip-flop is rising edge triggered. These pre and clears don't look at the clock at all, man. They just whack everything. Whenever you change them, they're going to whack the output. So let's see if we can see these features in the Logisim D flip-flop. Let's start off by replacing this with a clock. So let's see, where would we find a clock? Clock. Okay, and the clock's duration is one tick. All right, now let's go up to simulate and choose the tick frequency. So it's once per second. Let's make it two times per second. And then enable them. So now the clock's ticking. So in between a clock, I poke at it and I change it to a one. And it stays a one on the rising well, now let's see. Do we have this on the rising edge? No, we've got it at a high level. We want it on the, not the falling edge, not the high. There's also a low we haven't talked about. Let's get it on the rising edge. Okay. Let's slow the clock down a little bit so that we can, so it's going to change once every two seconds. So it's only going to be on the rising edge. There's a the rising edge. So it's going from a zero, which is dark green, to a one that's bright green, that's going to change. So it's going to change now. Yes. Now if I change my mind, it doesn't matter. In between, it doesn't matter. It's only what I have it on when it's going from a dark to a bright green. Now it's going to change. All right, now let's figure out what these are all about. This says preset. When set to a 1, it, it changes to a 1 asynchronously. So let's put some switches on these guys and try to figure out what they are. Okay, let's poke. 0. Yes. So right now this is having no effect on my circuit. It's going to change to a 1. Yes. 
Now I'm going to whack it. Is it changing my circuit? Well, let's get this down to a zero here. Yeah, see now it's not changing. So what was its name? It's a preset. So it's presetting it to a 1 no matter what. There's nothing I can do. It's going to lock this thing into a 1. This is the preset line. So this is not active low. This is active high. So when it's a 1, it's forcing this into a state of a 1. Now in our diagram earlier, it was active low. So I had to put a 0 here. But on this one, if I put a 0, it doesn't do anything. Right, because see, it says it's active when it's set to a 1. All right, so this is active high. Okay. So right now it's doing nothing. So if I put a 1 in here, it's going to change to a 1. Yes. All right, now let's put another switch over here on this guy. Okay, now the name of this is clear. So when it's a 1, it's going to clear this no matter what. So if I put this as a 1, poke at it, it's going to clear this to a 0, no matter what I put right here. should go, okay, it should go high. It doesn't go high at all. That's because of this 1 right here. So to turn it off, I basically go 0. All right. Now it goes high. Now, what's the evil state? It's when I make them both one. What's going to happen? I don't know. Not doing anything. It's remembering what it was, the last chaos. So it's sort of acting like the Logisim SR flip flop. Cool. Here we have a JK flip-flop. Now, JK came after, this is 1954, there was an AB flip-flop, a CD flip-flop, an EF flip-flop, a GH flip-flop, and then they skipped an I, and then there was a JK flip-flop. So this evolved way before computers, and its reason for existing today is because it creates a more efficient circuit than if you design around a D flip-flop. It creates a lot more Carnot maps, but they're simpler Carnot maps. You're not going to fully see this or appreciate this till we get in through chapter 7. But for right now, let's just look at it. Um, How is it different from a SR flip-flop? Well, it looks like K is reset, J is set, and what's different is this illegal state toggles the memory. There's a variation on the JK flip-flop called a toggle flip-flop, and it's really like a D flip-flop, JK style, so it's trying to combine the simplicity of the D flip-flop and the efficiency in terms of the final circuit output of a JK flip-flop and it almost works but the problem is how do you get it started in the first place I guess we just need to add some asynchronous presets and clear to get this thing started okay so we're done with the first half of chapter six play around with the JK and the T and the D and the SR flip-flop inside of Logicism like I did. And you should be good to go for the homework and the test. Good luck.